Okay, if you'll open your Bibles to uh, Genesis one fourteen, Genesis one fourteen, Genesis one fourteen. We're going to look at something I'm calling the twofold witness of the stars. For a reason, I hope. Uh, Genesis 1.14. Uh, there's three ways God, we've talked about this before, there's three way, ways that God reveals himself. Um, this is the first creation itself in the heavens, in the firmament. Verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. You can't see them in the day, but you can see them at night because of our star, the sun. Actually, I'm not going to even call it a star because the Bible doesn't. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Okay? So we know the purpose of them. God has signs for us. What, what do signs tell you to do? They tell you what to do. What's up ahead? And the signs there. Uh, and it precedes whatever's ahead, whether it be a blessing, whether it be a warning, whether it be disaster, whether it be glory, and for seasons. Okay, There's an aspect of these signs that are in their season. You get different signs in different seasons. Okay, um, Take a look at Psalms 19. Psalms 19. Psalms 19. Psalms 19. Now, we said there's three ways that God's revealed himself. Um, a good way to think of it is this way, this special revelation in the creation. He did it in such a way then, that when we look up into the heavens, um, we see his purpose for the earth to bring it back under his reign and authority. So a special revelation in the creation. Number two, thus saith the Lord, the spoken revelation. Number three, as it is written. Does Paul say as it is written? Yes, he does. Why? Well, the written re revelation has replaced the spoken revelation. I mean, do we care about a spoken revelation today? Because we know the Bible's, the revelation's complete. Okay, that is not an ongoing process today, inspiration. What we're looking at is the special revelation and something special for us in it. Okay, um, Psalms 19, Psalms chapter 19, Psalms chapter 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. You look up into the heavens and people just say, wow, look at the lights out there. Look at their number. Uh, Look at the wonderment of that number. And it says in 1 Corinthians 15, differing in glory, meaning light, the amount of light coming out of them. Um, it's hard for us to perceive distance, right, by sight. Um, but there's a lot of distance out there. Um, notice, the heavens declare the glory of God. What is the glory of God in the heavens? And the firmament showeth his handiwork. Well... There's something in the firmament. There's handiwork in the firmament. Day unto day uttereth speech. Okay. Day and what? A day is 12 hours and 12 hours. Day, night. Day first, then night. As, as uh, the creation was created. Okay. Um, and it showeth, notice, knowledge. There's more than just looking up at the number and the wonderment of the detail of it, the handiwork of it, the uncomprehensible handiwork of it. He goes on to say, there is no speech nor language. The language that he created that came later, remember at this, in the beginning, there was only one language. God spoke it, the Lord spoke it, an angelic being spoke it, and man spoke it. And they all communicated with one another. But Genesis chapter 6 
after the flood, language emerged. Well, this thing was language tolerant, this handiwork, this knowledge. It didn't require you to know. You didn't have to learn a language to know it. It's language tolerant. Notice it says, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. They speak something to the host of the earth, the sons of Adam. There's something spoken by the handiwork. Their line has gone out through all the earth. Well, we'll see that. Uh, the story, the prophetic purpose, is on a line. It's on a line. Like that. It's a circuit. And it's on a line. And you notice, therefore, signs and seasons. And then, then it, notice what it goes on to say there in Genesis chapter 1, in verse 14. And for days and what? Years. Days and years. Okay? Not only is the story told throughout one year, but the story is told over and over again every year. And the knowledge of the story, the prophetic pictures, are yet future are yet future to the initial host. Yet future. Okay. Um, he told mankind a message. Their line has gone out through the earth and their words. There's words in the message. The pictures are words. They can be taught. It can be taught. To the end of the world, is there any place it doesn't reach to? I drew this on here. We call this Capricorn. Okay, and we call this cancer. Okay, now Capricorn, there it is right there. You see that? In the winter. And in the winter, we're up here, we're up here, this latitude here, above cancer. But do you see how with 23 degrees of the stuff and its movement like this around the earth, right? I'm not doing it right, but okay. Its movement, the whole earth can see it on the lines, on the line, the line changes in terms of latitude, okay? The stationary earth, it changes, right? So that you get three, 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 four times three is 12, okay? Um, look at Psalms 147, Psalms 147. Psalms 147. Psalms 147. And take a look at verse 4. Now, I'm using this for a reason later. We'll see. Note, he telleth the number of the stars. He knows the number. Now, that's hard to imagine that you could count the number. I was recently uh, seeing that, uh, you know, Psalms 118, 7 and 8, that's not the middle of the Bible. You know what the problem with finding the middle of the Bible is? Verses aren't the inspired issue, the words are. And try to count the number of words in a Bible. I, and and I, I read somebody that said, well, here's the middle, because here's how many words there are. And the middle's two verses. It's an even number. But the problem with that is, how do you verify what the computer programmer came up with? I mean, to keep a tally, you have to make a record, or you can't keep a tally, unless you're some kind of savant or something. But, um, you know, but he telleth the number, and notice, not only that, he calleth them all by their names. See the word all? Every one of those things has a name. He knows their number, and every one of them has a name. Is there a sparrow that falls to the ground that he doesn't know about? So, um, take a look at Isaiah 40, 26. Isaiah 40, 26. Isaiah 40, 26. Isaiah 
Lift up your eyes on high. So we stand on the earth, and if we lift up our eyes, what we're looking at is the ecliptic, the path of the sun through the seasons in one year. Okay? Through the seasons. Each season has so many days. It's divided into four. The stuff moves. What's 23 plus 23? 46. So the stuff has a 46 degree movement. All the stuff. The firmament and everything in it goes like this, you know? Like this around us. Okay? Um, just picture it that way. Um, Notice, what did I say, verse uh, 26? No. Isaiah 40, 26, yeah. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold who hath created these things. What, what are the things? What we just said, the stars. Right? Number and name. That bringeth their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power. Not one faileth. That's an interest. I'm not going to get into that, though. We don't have time. Not one faileth? What does that mean? Might change, but it doesn't fail. That's what it means. I mean, as an astronomer, that's where I'd start with what he says. And then I'd try to observe and test my way empirically towards that thesis, his thesis. Not develop an antithesis to elicit the truth, relativism, and move away from it. <laughs> Take a look at Job 38.32. Job 38.32. Job 38.32. Uh, take a look at verse 31. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades? Now, Pleiades, as far as we can see it, through telescope or whatever, is made up of seven stars. And the name derives from the Greek, which I'm sure that's not his name for, him, for that grouping. The name, as remember, the groupings are not distance. The groupings are from a, what we see. If we see seven stars, can we tell their depth? Oh, we can't. But we see them as a group of seven. Okay. Notice it says influence. Well, what's the deal with Pleiades? Um, the Greek word means to sail, which is interesting. Sail means what? Some kind of circuit, right? Some kind of circuit. Uh, maybe Pleiades has something to do with organizing that flow this 46 degree flow around us. Um, canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades? I mean, do we have anything to do with that influence on this? Does this happen every year? Man, have anything to do with it? Nope. Can't even figure it out. Note, he says, or loose the bands of Orion. Can we move that thing apart? Can we scatter that thing? You know. Uh, canst thou bring forth Mazareth in his season? That's what I'm aiming for. Mazareth means 12. Three brought into view on the path of the sun, the ecliptic, right? 12 in their season. Um, What's the thing about 12? The 12 signs, the 12 signs of the zodiac. The issue with 12 is um, the number of God is 3, the number of the earth is 4. 3 times 4 is 12. So what does that tell me? Well, it tells me that it's an earthy program. And it is from the earth you look at it. Okay, when you look up your eyes. You know, we don't look up our eyes vertical. We look at, we look at the ecliptic, see? As we get in our summer, it gets closer to vertical, right? The sun, the path of the sun. But for the most part, and it's not even that hard to see in, the, in these, these constellations in their season. Um, how many tribes of Israel? Numbers, Numbers chapter 2, 12. 
How many apostles? Twelve. How many gates in the New Jerusalem? Twelve. How many furlongs square? Twelve thousand. Uh, the walls? How many cubits? 144. Twelve times twelve. 12,000 Israelites sealed by God during the tribulation. Is God's contention with Job from the animate creation is what we read about in, in the book of Job. Okay? And Job, can you create and sustain the beings, the being of these living creatures? Um, the list of animate creatures in Job 38 uh, if we look at 38 and 39, the first in the list is the lion. The last in the list is the eagle. Out of the animate creation, who's considered the king of the critters? Who's considered the king of the air? The fowls of the air. The eagle. The word zodiac means a collection of animals from the Greek zoon, English zoo. These stars are connected with visionary lines and they form living creatures and objects that told a story. And the signs of the zodiac are in a circle. Look at Psalms 19.6. We were there. Psalms 19.6. Five says, which is as the bridegroom coming out of the chamber, the son rejoices that a strong man to run a race. He's going for his going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The zodiac's in a circuit. Okay. A circuit that wavers. Okay. Um, I want to do something a little different here. You got your hand out, right? Do you see your hand out? That's another three-dimensional picture of this. Do you see that? At least cut in half. Um, and it's the sundial. It's a depiction of the sundial concerning that line and its movement. Uh, notice the, the north. On the, on the chart, notice the north. Who doesn't have one? Laura doesn't have one. The sick person. Laura. There you go. Okay. Um, one of the ways of determining north is the shortest shadows on the sundial during the day define the direction north. Okay? The shortest when the shadow is, the point of the shadow, you know how that thing throws a pointed shadow, the shortest is the direct is north on the sundial. Um, what's the star they call the north star? It's called Polaris. And it's called the pole star. Interesting. Um, that's God's direction. And we won't look it up, but Isaiah 14, 12 through 13, Psalms 48, 1 and 2, Hebrews 12, 22. That's the Lord's direction. Okay. Um, for your reference, two constellations um, occupy opposite sides of the North Star, Polaris. The Big Dipper. Okay. Seven bright stars in a circle around Polaris. Everybody knows about the Big Dipper, don't they? And then Cassiopeia. You know the W? It stands for Wiltshire. <laughs> okay. And Polaris is above the first V of the W. Okay. So those are ways you can identify it. And also Ursa Minor, the Little Dipper. Polaris is the last star in its tail. Okay. I just frame a reference in terms of the North Star. Um, it, notice on your handout, I had to cross out something. It says the apparent path of the sun across the sky. It's not apparent. It's literal. <laughs> They're saying it doesn't move, the sun. Uh, from the time you were little, our solar system 
what did you see? And what did you depict? And was it pounded into you? Unmercifully, was it pounded into you? Let's make sure they got it wrong, right? Um, the sun's not stationary. Just like the Bible says, the sun's on the move around the earth. Um, I'll stop there so I can keep moving here. Um, I want to show you something about these 12 signs, okay? Um, look at Leviticus chapter 1. Leviticus chapter 1. There's a lot of things in the book of Leviticus. Um, there's ceremonial laws. Um, uh, there's uh, the great day in Israel's redemptive calendar, the Day of Atonement, the feasts, uh, legislation for worshipers, um, five cycles of judgment at the end of Leviticus for the nation of Israel that's ongoing. Um, but the book of Leviticus has four great offerings at its outset in chapters 1 through 5. The burnt offering, the meat offering, the peace offering, and the sin offering. Okay? And all of these things are brought by the free will of the bringer, a voluntary offering. And they're to all be spotless, perfection, in other words, without sin. Um, they're to be male, at least the burnt offering is to be male. The, the meat offering, uh, the peace offering can be male and female, and there's a reason for that, and there's a reason for the other. The burnt offering is male, the second Adam. Okay? They were to wash the innards of the burnt offering. That is, body, soul, and spirit, as it were. Inside and outside, washed. Uh, we've been sanctified, Thessalonians. Paul's epistle, the first, first epistle to the Thessalonians, body, soul, and spirit. You see the picture there? And for Israel, um, uh, it's hands, it's, it's hands on, it's hands on the head. Why? Cover the sin on the head. Cover the sin. Um, the sin offering, sinless, sinlessness transfigured to the worshiper, and the victim is made the sin. Okay. Um, out of the offerings, the burnt offering represents in the Bible, I'm going through this fast, okay, Christ's death. The meat offering, Christ's living. The peace offering, by the blood of the cross, reconciliation with God. Uh, priceless, the blood and the fat sprinkled on the altar and roundabout offered to God. Um, the sin offering and the trespass offering. The sin offering for the priest, the whole congregation, the ruler. One of the common people also in this case for this sin offering. Okay, The burnt offering outside the camp. Blood and fat offered to God. Uh, if you look at the, um, the three offerings, I circled three of these things. Okay, And we're going to look at them. Um, the goat. You remember there's two offerings? There was... The sin offering, and that was given to Jehovah, and it was slain on the mercy seat. And then there was what? The scapegoat. We've studied this, right? And it was set free. No accuser. Set free. Victory. So you, you have one goat. Death represents death, and the other one victory. And then the lamb, the great day of atonement of the lamb. The ram is a lamb. Okay, uh, Leviticus 16.3, the ram, the burnt offering, the lamb taking away the sins of the nation and the world through that nation. Abel's lamb redeemed one man. Isaac's lamb in type redeemed the entire world in a prophetic earthly program. Okay, now, when we look at these things, First one, Virgo. Last one, Leo. Okay. Um, what's this mean? Isaiah 7, 14. Virgin. Sinless virgin. Born of a virgin. Not the virgin sinless, 
but the sinless child from the virgin. The virgin needed a savior. And she says it herself in the scriptures. And Luke 2. Okay? Libra. The unbalanced scales. In other words, what? Works. Works. Daniel 5, 27. Psalm 62, 9. Scorpius. The scorpion. The sting of death. So what do these first three signs do? They convict the Israelite. They convict the sons of Adam. Before there was Abraham, they convict them of sin. This sinless one comes for and convicts in his first advent sinners whose works can't reach to heaven on the scales. And the result is what? The scorpion does what? And the sting is what? Death. And the sting of the law is death. That law, it nails us. Okay? That, that's interesting, isn't it? So you start out with the fall equinox, and you're convicted of sin by these three. That's the story they tell. Okay? Then we get the winter solstice, the winter sky. Okay? And that's made up of Sagittarius, Capricornus, and Aquarius. Sagittarius. That's the archer, the warrior, Revelation 6.2. Revelations 19.11, the one that comes to defeat the old serpent. Okay, Then you've got Capricornus, the goat. Okay, The sacrifice, the sin offering, the trespass offering. right? So this one comes to defeat the adversary. Okay, And that happens before the second advent, doesn't it? This one right here is the sacrifice for it, the atonement. Israel, does she wait for her atonement? Right now she does. Why? Well, we already have it. They're waiting to get theirs with the coming of Messiah in his second advent. Then you've got Aquarius, the water bearer. Okay. Uh, the reach of his sacrifice will go afar to the isles, right, through the kingdom program, the Gentiles. And they won't thirst. It'll be living water for all. I mean, when you go to Revelations 22, 1, what's flowing out of the throne of God? A river of what? Pure water. Drink of it and have eternal life. Um... Does you know you know the the the, myth, the the mythology in the wisdom of man concerning the Bible? Uh, what's the deal? Well, you know what? I'll talk about it later. But does man imitate that in this continent? An explorer. We'll talk about it later. Um, do you remember who it was? Does anybody know the name? You can visit the place. What are they looking for? What was this explore, French explorer looking for? Something better. By doing what? The fountain of, what do they call it? We'll talk about it a little bit more this morning. The fountain of youth. See the imitation there? Uh, the imagination there. So Aquarius. So what do these three represent? The reach of his sacrifice will go afar, bringing living water to all. Then you have in uh, the spring sky, Pisces, Aries, and Tarius. What's Pisces? Well, that's two fish. Well, what did the Lord do with two fish? He fed how many? 5,000 from two fish. Two fish. What's that represent? represents a couple things. One thing it represents is he fed 5,000 with two. Was he two in one? Was he God and man? He was the God man. The theanthropic man. He was the God man. And 5,000. Five is the number for, guess what? Grace. 
From this one came what? A gift. The gift of eternal life. That's Pisces. Okay. Aries. That's the lamb or the ram. Okay, in Leviticus chapter 1. Um, John one twenty nine. What's what's John the Baptist say? Behold, what? The Lamb of God that will take away what? The sins of the world. Okay. Um, guess what? There's 66 stars in this sign. <laughs> hmm. Remember, he created it. it. It's not just, it's not, if he has a name and he numbers every one of them, is it spontaneous? Is it capricious? No meaning? No, we just read it. It's a story. It's purposeful. Right down to signs and seasons, right down to every star. Is every star in these, in, in the, in, in the line? No. He picked out stars in the line, just like our language in the words. Are all the words of our language in the Bible? He picked out the words. He chose the words to represent and reveal His will and His eternal purpose. Okay, so you've got the lamb. What's Tars? It's the bull. Okay. Bull. Is that a burnt offering for sin? Was the lamb a burnt offering for sin? What's the bull represent? Trampling underfoot. Uh, they got that thing in in uh, Mexico and, and in Spain, and they're talking about it right now. And what is that thing about? Don't get trampled by the by the bulls. Trampled. You don't want to get trampled and gored underfoot. Okay. Um, what do these three represent? The Lamb, the first advent, will trample all underfoot through His mighty offering of Himself. Okay, a step in the process out of the four. Okay, the cross work. Okay, the redemptive work, um, the sacrificial blood work. Then you have the last three. Now, granted, we're going through this real fast. Okay, Gemini. What's that mean? The twins. The same one, the God man. The twofold nature of Messiah, the Son of God and the Son of Man, declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Then the crab, cancer. What's that represent? Security. You ever seen a crab grab something? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John talk about his first advent and those that are his that the Father gave him. And he won't lose one of them. And the crab is represented by that security. Then the last, Leo the lion. It's hardest to not spend time on this one. But when you look at Genesis chapter 49, by the way, Gemini, Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, right? The son of Abraham and the son of David and the son of Abraham. Abraham, the picture there is the sacrifice, right, of Isaac. Um, Leo, Genesis 49.9. Micah 5.2 from the tribe of Judah. Luke 1.32 and 33. Revelations 20.10. The second advent, advent, the prophetic return of Messiah. Um, the brightest star in Leo is Regu Regulus. Um, they call it uh, the star at the lion's breast. And it's the brightest star in the constellation. It has a bluish color to it. So if you know where it is, you can see it in the summer sky. That'd be now. You want to go out and look sometime. Get away from the lights of man so you can see the lights of God. And it's one of the brighter skies in the entire sky. Okay. Um, the corruption of this sign right here is prominent in the earth and lives today, as it were, in the Sphinx. The virgin, the long-haired guy on the body of a lion. 
do we know exactly what went on at Genesis chapter 11 and what they were studying? What they were studying in unbelief, which means corruption. They corrupted this entire prophetic purpose. So then God sent his prophets, and they did what? We've been studying that a little bit at the breakfast. He sent his prophets, thus saith the Lord. When Christ comes, he does a lot of what? As it is written, as it is written, as it is written. Does Paul say as it is written? You've got to know how Paul uses the Old Testament. It's not for us to get under the law in time past, but rather to illustrate spiritual principles. Okay? Um, another thing. The lion's feet in this constellation are over the constellation Hydra. What's Hydra? The great serpent. <laughs> so here's Leo and his feet, the lion's feet, are over Hydra. And he is underfoot. Is that a huge theme in the Bible? Is that Genesis 3.15? He'll bruise his heel and he'll do what? Crush his head. Is that depicted in the prophetic purpose of God in the skies? Absolutely. Absolutely. God's witness of the stars for signs and seasons. Okay? It's in your bulletin here. Look at uh, Revelations 1.18. Romans one eighteen, Romans one eighteen, Romans one eighteen, Romans. Now that's a real quick movement through this. But of course, does Paul teach this witness of the stars this way? Does Paul teach that at all? He refers to it in the beginning of the measure, the body of truth given to the church, the body of Christ. Romans 1, and I want you to notice there's something I saw for the first time yesterday, because I'm an idiot. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. For the wrath of God, now pay attention to the words, is revealed from where? From heaven. See that right there? Sting of what? Death. See this here? The water of what? Life. By what? The price paid. So that what? He can rule with a host. Okay? Um, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Where do you see it? Well, in the fall, you see this, don't you? You're convicted of your sin in the fall of the year, according to that, I would say, ancient special revelation. He says, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Isn't that what this first group does? What's the first issue of our gospel? To convict the hearer of sin and the what? Consequences of it physical and spiritual death. Hence, with the burnt offering, you wash the inward parts. Is Israel going to be sanctified, body, soul, and spirit, in a physical body, a terrestrial body? Yep. Um, note, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They saw this picture. They saw this picture because it was shown to Adam, and Adam did what? Communicated it. Spoken, he communicated this object of knowledge, this line of words in pictures. I, I, there was Craig and I, Craig and I both know a, a builder. He fell off a ladder now and didn't recognize anybody. He had serious head, you know, trauma to his head. And Craig Barth, and he used to tell us, "I got a Bible," because we'd be studying the Bible at lunch. And he go, "I got a Bible." I got a picture Bible. <laughs> well, that's ancient, isn't it? And it's corrupted. And it's corrupted. Um, the story as Adam heard it, right here, verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for he hath showed it unto them. Why is it in them? Because it's made up of words, right? And it's on a line, and it conveys knowledge about the purpose and will of God in the earth. And they had that truth, and they held it in unrighteousness, in wrongdoing. 
They had it. And what did they do? They ignored it while Noah was built in the ark. Built? Building the ark. Was he preaching for a hundred years? How about Enoch? Was he preaching? Of God's wrath to come. See, that's the first. It's the first issue in the gospel. Oh, we don't talk about hell here. We just talk about life. We just talk about life. Well, that's not how God does it. And that's not how he did it. And that's not how he does it. Look at Genesis 11. Genesis 11. Genesis 11. What did man do to God's special revelation? So the story as Adam heard it and told it to Genesis 11, then man corrupted it in unbelief. And that's Genesis 11. If you look at two verses, look at four. And they said, go, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto what? What are they trying to reach? The zodiac. The mythological creatures. Where do you think the Greeks get all that stuff? You think they came up with it? No, God used the critter to tell a story, a prophetic purpose, a line to give knowledge with words that could be communicated. Picture book. Okay, easy to see. Uh, did man have to figure it out? Did he have to join the lines? You know how you get those points in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a drawing book? And you have to connect the points, connect the dots? Where do you think that idea came from? Who connected the dots for him? God did. It says he showed it to them. We got it in Romans 1. In Genesis chapter 11, look at the response to the Lord as they try to reach up and worship the signs, the critters. Isn't that what Egypt does? What they worship? Creeping things. Creeping things. Creeping things. Is there danger in snakes? Can you trample them in under, underfoot? But what may happen to you if you try that? Boom. Right? Um, verse, uh, verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do. Look what they're doing. They're taking my special creation in the firmament of signs and seasons on a line. And the knowledge of it. And they're corrupting it. So what does he do? Now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Do they continue to imagine? and mythologize truth, hold the truth in unrighteousness. They do. Now, here's the amazing thing that I hadn't seen before, not in this light. Uh, what does God do? Does he show, does he show um, Abraham does he give him a special illustration? Two? Two? Do you remember what they were? And the dust of the, the sands of the sea, right? Now, the sands of the sea, now here's the thing about this. They corrupt this story, this truth, this prophetic purpose to bring back his rule and authority over the earth, which is his, okay? And he says, okay, they corrupted it. I'll tell you what. Count the sands. <laughs> Count the dust of the earth. Count the sands. Because th th that's what thy, thy seed shall be in number. That's what thy, thy seed shall be in number. But he doesn't just do that. You know what he does? This is amazing. Look at Genesis 15. And he brought him forth abroad. Uh, let's get to a nice spot where you can take a good look. Up at the heaven. And he says, and he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven. Did he show his handiwork on the earth as one looks up towards the heaven? Yeah. And tell the number of the stars. Now in this thing, is number the issue? Is number the issue in this? No. Number is not the issue. So what did he do in essence? 
We're, we're past Genesis 11 where man corrupts his prophetic purpose. Okay? Visualized by signs according to their season. Man corrupts it. So what does he do? Don't think that takes away his purpose. That's what he's saying. Not only will this produce fruit, number in the earth, as Israel being the agency of blessing to all the isles, all the Gentiles, a great number. It'll fill the earth, okay, as a result of this. So, as it were, man comes along and goes, well, you know what? Where's my eraser? Man comes along and corrupts it. And what does he do in essence? There, Lord, your purpose be not adversary, right? I have a purpose. I have a sevenfold purpose, right? So what's the Lord do? He says, all right. Oh, it is going to happen. And I'll show you the number of it. See if you can count the stars. Can he count the stars? You know, that's why I know there's a certain number that's going to be in the church, the body of Christ. Why? Because he knows the number. If you can count them, that's what your seed, Abraham, shall be according to what? My mystery purpose. Not only uh, if you could count the sands of the sea, right? Not only that, but now, Abraham, look up towards the heaven because I got a secret purpose, a mystery purpose, and I'm going to take those ones that corrupted my special revelation and purpose in the earth, those ones are going to be displaced and I'm going to raise up a seed. Isn't that what Abraham? If you can count the number of the stars, so shall thy seed be. Is Abraham our father? Do you see the special thing in that? It's like, this is erased. And the Lord says, no, it's not. Take a look. Now the issue is not signs in their season on the ecliptic. Now the issue, issue is the vast numbers of the church, the body of Christ in the heavenly places. I think that's amazing. You see what I'm saying? He's saying the fruit of this will not only be a prophetic purpose in the earth, but a mystery purpose in the heavens. And Abraham, so shall thy seed be. And remember, that's right after Genesis 11. You want to eradicate... By worshiping the creature, right, over the creator, Abraham, you see those stars? Okay, wipe them out, count them. That's what my seed's going to be in the heavenly places through my mystery purpose. Does Paul teach this purpose? You refer to it? Only in Romans chapter 1 and then what? He records, Paul, God records that they rejected it and they corrupted it. And he raised up Abraham, our father. You know what Jew says to you, Abraham's our father? And I say, Abraham's my father and your father. What about Muhammad? How about the moon god, Islam? Hey, Ishmael had the same God that Isaac did. <laughs> I got news for you. Ishmael had the same God. So my point is, um, God, as it were, rubs out the zodiac and shows Abraham the fruit of it, numerous in number in the heavenly places, based on faith in the blood by the righteousness of God our Savior, his way of dealing with sin. Okie doke. You get it?